guys, like I said, it, it is wonderful to be with you tonight, even in this, even in this strange way. And, um, and my real hope is that I can just encourage you guys. My heart is really with you as students, as twenties at the moment, and um, and just particularly around those new starters for for university or coming back with everything that's going on and how the lockdown is affecting you. I know that and I've been reading news articles on those things and just hearing how hard it is. So I really pray that you would get an encouragement from the Lord in what I have to uh, to bring this evening to you as well. Um, so just if I'm going to be looking down a bit, so I wrote this as a standard preach. So it, there's a, I've got some notes down here. So if I look, I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to remember what I've written to actually share with you this evening. And, um, and I, my aim is not to take too long the, this evening or be too complicated and Caleb if um, if I start going too fast or getting excited for your signer and his hands start turning on fire or her hands start turning on fire you just let us know and I'll just slow it down uh, a, a notch as well um, I can't I can't see you so I can't gauge today whether that pace is working um, thanks very much I can see you there that's great just just let me know like that and I'll do my best just to just to be um, at a good pace. I mean, uh, at its essence, all I want to do tonight for you guys where you're at is ask you a question. God put a question on my heart for you this evening. One that I believe is particularly important for your stage of life where you are now as either new students progressing through university or 20s, just really starting out um, in setting your own course of life. And the question is, the question is this. It's just, what are you going to do with your leg of the race? That's the question. What are you going to do with your leg of the race? Um, I'm assuming you have all seen uh, relay races um, in your lifetime, you know, four by 100 sprint, where people pass something that looks like this. Look, no expense spared this evening. I've got props, it's a baton, and well, it's a piece of wood, but, you know, where people run their 100 meter sprint, then they pass it on to the next person and on it goes. And the aim is to, between four people, pass this baton as fast as you can from beginning to end and get the baton across the line. The baton is the important thing within that. I mean, it's one of my favorite events in athletics, actually, um, particularly that sprint version, just because wow, they go so flipping fast. Um, it's just really exciting, I think, seeing them work as a team. And I think it's just in the ebbs and flows of races just lasts a bit longer than some of the other races. Um, sometimes one team's on top of the race, sometimes another. And, um, you know, no one wants to let the team down. There's, there's this added pressure on it, I think. Uh, loads of tactics. Do you know, I remember the British men winning the Olympics in 2004 in this, in this race and it just being absolutely phenomenal. And the, the British women later come third, I think it was in 2016, but I also remember the heartaches of this race and the, the kind of media outrage after it, where someone's run a poor leg, you know, let the team down. Somebody didn't pick up the baton properly when they were supposed to. Someone didn't hand over in that allotted space that they've, that they've got. You know, worst of all, somebody just, oh no, butterfingers, they've dropped the, they've dropped the baton. Uh, you know, and sadly, I think in British athletic history, there are loads of cases. We seem to boom or bust in this. We either do really well at it or we just do horrendously and somebody's, somebody's dropped it. Um, and the team's disqualified as a, as a result. And I, I want to say to you tonight that there is no better picture of the Christian life than this idea of being part of a relay race and running a race. You know, this is why the Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, used the language of being in a race all the time in his writings. Just one example is 1 Corinthians 9, 24, where he urges us to become like athletes in the way that we run our faith and, and life of faith. Or where it, it, particularly he's handing on his mission to his son in Christ, the next generation of believer, Timothy. And he writes in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept hold of the faith. I've kept hold of that baton the whole way to pass it on to you. You see, when Paul writes like this, he's telling us something. He's telling us that he understood that when he became a Christian, he became part of the greatest relay race ever run. And he's saying that for his leg of the race when he passes this on. That leg of the race that followed directly after Jesus, that he held on to what was entrusted to him tightly, the baton of the gospel. And he ran well with it and he passed it on. That's what he was saying to Timothy as he left him and gave him all the instruction for how he was to go on and live a life in Christ. And I wonder this evening, have you understood what Paul did in your Christian life? That when you became a Christian, you also became part of the greatest relay race ever run. Has that been something that you've understood in your walk and your Christianity? You know, this is a relay race that started with Jesus, was passed on to the apostles and to Paul, to Timothy, and then has carried on through history as person after person has faithfully taken what has been given to them and run with it, then passed it on, just as Paul did. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Constantine, Augustine of Hippo, Basil and Gregory of Nicaea, Anselm, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Lay, Bunyan, Wesley, Whitfield, Edwards, Brainerd, Hudson Taylor, Spurgeon, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Corrie ten Boom, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham, Jackie Pullinger, my mum, and countless more. Each of them took that baton, held tightly to it, ran with it, cherished it, and never loosened their grip on it. They lived it. And when their time came, they passed it on to the next leg of the race. And now in your life, 2,000 years on, that baton carried by so many through every season of history has been handed to you. It's been handed on to, to you. If I could hand it through the screen. There we go. Look at that. There you go. But, you know, but what has it? What has been handed to you in this relay race? What what is it? What what is this baton that you've been handed to carry and pass on? What does it look like? Well, it's this. Look, as if by magic here. Actually, it's a cross shaped baton. That's that's what it is. For those of you who can see that, I've tied two bits of wood together and made it into a very exciting prop for you this evening to illustrate my point. Do you know, the truth is, if you believe in Christ, you have been fully handed this baton, completely. Particularly two things about it, though. One, you've been handed the example of the cross to live by in your life. And two, you have been given the effects of the cross to live in as well. Do you know, the cross is so rich and so beautiful. There are books upon books written about this that I can't do it justice or either of these things fully justice this evening. Right now, I want to just give you a whistle-stop theology of what I mean, though, by each of them when I say the example of the cross to live by and the effect of the cross to live in. So we'll start with the example of the cross to live by, if that's okay. Do you know, when it comes to this example, when it comes to the example of the cross and living by the example of the cross and following it, the example that we have been given is this. It's of a God who chose to humble himself completely, lay his life down to make sure his enemies and those who could not help themselves could know his love, his forgiveness, and his grace in their own lives, that they could know him. So it's a God who made himself lowly to love us. That's the example of the cross. 
I am sure if you've been a Christie for any amount of time that you've heard that before. It's not, it's not new news to you. But I often think over familiarity with certain truths like this one can cause us to miss the wonder and the power of what we're being given in certain aspects of it. And this is one of them. Let me see if I can elaborate a little bit for you. You know, the cross was given in the Roman Empire. This happened in the Roman Empire, and that's really important. The Roman Empire was one of the most survival of the fittest empires that there ever was. Power in this empire was everything. The poor were not regarded in this empire. There were no ideas like human rights present in this empire. They had not been conceived yet. You killed your enemies in the most brutal and torturous ways. Women and slaves were possessions of the powerful to do what they wanted with. In this culture, do you know the words sex and urination had the same word for them because they were seen as being the same thing. And it was just something you did to women in this culture. It wouldn't have been uncommon to see babies on rubbish dumps. And the weak and the vulnerable were open to assault and violence that we would see people imprisoned for in our day. That was the understanding. That is a picture. I'm not overstating it as well. I recently read an outstanding book on this culture and the history of it, of what the Roman Empire was like. Sometimes we look back with rose-tinted glasses rather than really seeing what it was like. But that's how people lived in their understanding. Very different to our understanding and mindset. Yet, it was in this culture where gods did not lay down their lives for people for the week, and people didn't either. There was no deep value of people and humanity. You know, this was an empire of conquering and ruling others. Yet this was the soil in which the seed of the gospel was planted. The cross was planted in this place. And it went on to transform that whole empire, that whole way of looking and valuing people, and has gone on to change culture today and still is changing Western culture and beyond, actually, with a foundation of love and valuing people that was not there before. That's the example that you've been passed on. So when Paul writes to the church in Philippi in this completely Greco-Roman context, Philippians 2, 4, 4 8, he writes this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look to his own interests, but the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When he's telling us to follow that example in our lives and the way that we live in every single context, he was saying in your leg of the race, live radically differently from those around you. Always in every context, as I have modelled, live a radically different way of living. Lay your life down for the poor and the weak of this world as I lay my life down for you. Don't get caught in power seeking and miss a love for others that I set the example for on this. As Christians, you have been given now in your life this model and charge. That's what's been passed on to you, part of the cross-shaped baton that's been passed on to you, a way of living your life. How will you live this example to lay down your life for others? in your context, so they may love and know that incredibly culture-changing, life-changing, world-changing love that shaped the whole of history through your example. 
this is the example that the cross says when I'm talking about that. That's my whistle stop tour of the example of the cross that has been passed to you. What about the effect of the cross? What about the other part of it, to live in? So that's the bit that you live out, the example to live out, the effect that you live in. Do you know, when it comes to the effect of the cross, the Bible is clear that the, the cross is not just a random act in history, but that it achieved something for you, something huge for you. When you trusted in it, the cross changed some stuff for you forever. When you believed in the cross and Jesus, it was a bit like you were given a new passport, a new citizenship of a totally different kingdom by a king. A new national identity, which brought with it a whole host of stuff that you didn't have the right to access before. Things that will never be taken from you now again. This isn't a passport that will be taken from you. It's been given to you and given you access to some things. I'm just going to touch on three of those things very quickly. Firstly, forgiveness from God says this passport brought you forgiveness from God for everything you have ever or will ever do wrong. Phenomenal forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7 to 8 outlines this. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, which is wrongdoing, according to the riches of his grace. His grace, total forgiveness because of his grace, just because of his goodness. Never deserved it. There you go. I completely consider you forgiven, he says. The cross has moved you. One of the things it has changed for you is it has moved you from being a person where all of your wrong, shameful thoughts, your actions, your deeds counted against you, where there was a list against you that said, hey, Phil, you know, you hurt that person, you behaved in that way, you did that thing. And it made you a different person where that list has forever been burnt up. It's gone. It's toasted. Dealt with at the cross. God will never accuse you again and will only ever point out wrongdoing doing to free you from it so you can step into the fullness of his grace in it and forgiveness never to condemn you or shame you again. Secure, freedom, shame-free, washed clean in him. That's one effect of the cross for you when you believed in him. Secondly, when you believed in the cross, you became a person God wanted to be and made a way to be with personally every day, every moment of every day, he made a way. It's going to take a touch of explaining this one. Bear with me. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this. Do you not know, and he speaks to the church in this context, do you not know that you are a temple that God's spirit and that God's spirit dwells in you? Secondly, he uses a similar language, but pointing to the individual. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. So in both of these statements, Paul uses the Old Testament idea of the Jewish temple to explain something very important that the cross affects. In the Old Testament, the temple was the place where God's spirit dwelt amongst the Jewish nation and where priests spoke to him face to face directly. They found out God's will, God's desires for the people. They stood before him on behalf of the people. It was here where man could actually meet with God personally on earth, inside this temple building. It was literally God's home on earth, this temple. But it was a place that had to remain totally pure, we see throughout the whole Testament, sin-free, Idle free is some of the language they use for this purpose of being his dwelling place. So throughout the Old Testament, if you read it or looked at it, there are times when the temple got muckied and sullied. People put things that weren't of God's heart, that were sinful in there. And as a result, God's spirit 
leaves this temple place. So sometimes this is portrayed from the ark, sometimes it's just portrayed by his presence. Until that was, now and then throughout the Old Testament, a leader comes along and he removes this dirt completely from the temple so that God's presence could be restored to it. In these times, the temple was washed completely clean, totally cleansed from this, and God's presence came to dwell back in God's home again. And this is really important here, because by using this language about people here, about us, using it about the church as a group of people and about the individual, Paul is saying that the forgiveness of the cross, the washing of the cross, was not just so all your wrongdoing could be forgiven, but it was also to give you such a deep clean, such a clean out, to the level that you were able to be a home for him like the temple was, a place in which he could come and dwell and his presence could be met with on earth. Every day, every moment of every day, this huge once and for all washing from sin was so that he could come and dwell in you and be with you. He's saying you are now his dwelling place. That's the second thing that has changed for you from ever from believing in the cross. Forgiveness, and you've made, been made into a person that God wants to spend every moment of every day with. Phenomenal. Finally, and very quickly, you have been given eternal life. That's the the third thing that's just got to tag on there. It's pretty important. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just in case the forgiveness that I've explained wasn't enough, and you being made into a home where God wants to dwell wasn't enough, another effect of washing away your wrongdoing is that the consequences of all that wrongdoing The punishment for all that wrongdoing is gone. And you have now been given the key to the door of eternal life. Paul writes this triumphantly. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You're not stinging anymore. Sorry about that if you've heard that before. 1 Corinthians 5.15, death has no sting. As Christian, you have been pulled from a nation that was heading the way of the Roman Empire and every single worldly empire all worldly kingdoms, destruction, where you were working for a king who was ultimately pay you in death. He'd take you down with him. But now your cross passport has brought you into an ending everlasting kingdom, which where, where there is no death, it will not die, it will go on eternally. And your wages in Jesus are to live as a part of that kingdom eternally. Because of the cross, you are now a citizen of heaven with a different future. Other parts of the Bible quite literally say a new creation. There are just three effects of the cross. I know it's a whistle-stop tour, okay, which you now stand in if you believe in this. It's just a fragment, and it is just a fragment. That's the wonder of it. It's just a fragment, what I've given you, of the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done. But this is the baton that you have been entrusted with for your leg of the race. This is it. This is what has been handed on to you by generations before. This is the example and the effect of the extremely good news of the cross. What are you going to do with this cross-shaped baton in your leg of the race? Are you going to take on its example? Are you going to let your life shine bright with its truths in every circumstances? Are you going to plant yourself like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden? Or are you going to hide your light? Listen, when I started talking, I'm just going to finish with this for you. When I started talking tonight, I said that this was a particularly important question for you now. What are you going to do with your leg of the race? Why do I say this? It's because of this. In every relay race, there is a transition point where one leg finishes and another one picks up. It's one of the riskiest, but it's also one of the most exciting parts of the race. There is a crossover often in this time where two runners are running together 
and the baton is quite literally passed from hand to hand. Done well, it can be the point in which the race is won. Done badly, the baton gets dropped, someone trips up, and the race is over for someone. University and early 20s is a handover time in your life. It's a key transition point for your life. You have had now the input of all of those who went before you. You've had the faith of your parents. You've had your home friends. You've had a home church. Youth groups that have sown into your life. But at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, what are you, Sarah? Are you 25? Other Sarah? No, Sarah Gillard, you're 24. So I know that the most impostery person is Sarah Gillard here at 25, at least, you know, like, so all of these times. Do you know, but these are years when you start in a new way to take a firm grasp of the baton yourself in a new context, to look at the wonder of the life that lies before you. And it's a new way where you get to step into, in a fresh way, to all that God has laid before us. <laughs> at least I didn't invite my 30-year-old husband. He's a youth Sarah at 30, you know that. Listen, but it can also, this can also be a point where we drop the ban. It can be. I've seen it, and sadly. Or we say, I don't want to keep carrying this ban. It feels a bit heavy. And we lose grip on all that Jesus has asked us to be in this world and all that he's done for us. We get our heads turned by some other shiny thing. This was never shiny, but it's always more beautiful. Let me urge you not to get your head turned. Don't lose the wonder of the cross. It is as wonderful today as it ever has been in history. It's as powerful today as it ever has been in history. And I wanna urge you to take hold of it fully for yourself and work out what it means to take fully hold of this yourself in your life and what your leg of the race looks like now. Listen, my prayer for you is that you have an amazing year this year, even with the pandemic going on, it does not stop the power of God and the gospel. Thanks for listening to me this evening. I hope that has, like I say, my aim is to encourage you. God bless you.